following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. The title of our lecture today is Pistis Sophia and Yalda Bayot, The Power and Wisdom of the Children of the Void. Pistis Sophia is a book written uh, many centuries ago that outlines the story and the um, path of somebody who is attempting to incarnate wisdom within themselves. This book was written um, sometime around um, shortly after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who in this book is called uh, Abramento. It says that uh, 11 years after he resurrected that he gave these teachings. So the book itself is very elevated, speaking about someone, or it's really pointed towards someone who's already on the path, who's already developed themselves in a certain degree. It's very esoteric, and it's very alchemical and Kabbalistic, very veiled in symbolism. But this book was lost for quite some time, at least to our visible public eyes, and was found um, not too long ago, relatively speaking. But it also sat in, it, it, it sat in obscurity for quite a long time, even though physically we had it, the scholars and the people who read it really couldn't make any sense of it. So it sort of just sat in a collection of a museum for a while. It wasn't until even more recently that uh, Samael Unveor read it and meditated on it and gave some explanations about it, which we can see coincides with this uh, universal doctrine of the science of how to awaken our consciousness and how to develop all the capacities of our soul, all the capacities of what it is to be a human being. So it's a very difficult book to read, but today we're going to look at it just from one small perspective, just one small part of it, because a, a large portion of the book, it's really multiple books, but there's a portion of it called the story of Pistis Sophia. And Sophia goes through a drama and she gives a number of repentances, 13 repentances, to ascend back into the light after she lost it. All of this has to do with our soul. All of this has to do with our own work on ourselves. At the same time, this book, or any story, any true religious book, also deals with the outer world. So, the book of Genesis, for example, 
Typically, we think of it as a book that talks about the creation of the world or the universe. This is true. But the, most, the more important aspect when we're studying spirituality is how it relates to our own genesis. How it, create, how it uh, relates to the creation of what needs to happen within ourselves. So this, this book, the Pista Sophia, deals with that as well. It, it, everything in it has multiple layers of meaning. So before we read from the actual Pista Sophia, we can uh, study a little bit what it means when the universe creates. What, what is that exactly? Typically, we think of our we think of uh, we think of God or deity as being almighty. But from a more mystical or Gnostic perspective, there's something that's even beyond God, that's even beyond deity. That is a word that we call seity. In Kabbalah, or in Judaism, the word for God is often Elohim, which really means gods and goddesses. But there's another word, which is a Elohim, which is an A in front of Elohim, which means not God, or beyond God. It's negating what that God is. So what we are saying here is that there is an absolute that's beyond this creation. And the gods are those forces which manage this creation. And we as a soul and as a spirit have a connection to that. When we fully develop our capacities we incarnate that God, or that God is incarnated in the perfected soul of an individual. But there's something even beyond that, and that's the absolute. So the gods come out of the absolute, and the absolute is an abstract space where neither matter nor energy nor spirit exists. It's a non-existence. So Samael Anveor writes in his book, Christ's Will, This universe exists because of karma. Even the gods exist in this universe because of karma. When the causal logos initiated its electrical movement at the dawn of the Maha Manvantara, nothing was heard but weeping pleading and lamentation of children. At the dawn of the Maha Manvantara, the gods wept. The causal logos contains in its divine mind all the karmic causes that originated the existence of this universe. Thus, when that great being began to move upon the face of the waters, there was nothing but the weeping and lamentation of gods. Little by little, the uncreated light of the Absolute began to withdraw from the gods. Thus, this is how they fell into this mass of universal shades. Hence, when the great Logos that expresses itself as electricity and all that exists emanated from within itself, the Logos of the solar system and the seven planetary genii, nothing was heard but bitter weeping. When the gods fertilizing the chaotic matter with the fire began to weave in the loom of God, nothing was heard but bitter weeping. The gods wept in their exit from the Absolute. They wept for the uncreated light that had already become darkness for them. And they justified themselves saying, I am not guilty, I am innocent, etc. The gods fell when the Great Mother robbed their life, robbed their fire. Then the Great Mother shone with pleasure with the universal protogonos. So in these lines here, these 14 lines, 11 lines, I'm sorry. In these 11 lines, an immense amount of information is being displayed here. 
karma is the predicate of this existence. Everything exists for a cause, because of a cause. And that's what karma is. Karma is not simply a gift or punishment of some sort. It may appear that way, it may be symbolized in that way, but the reality of karma is cause and effect. So the universe came into existence out of a cause. Or we could say there were causes still within, latent within that absolute abstract space, which caused creation to emerge. In the same way that a seed, inside of a seed, can be all the potential and all of the factors needed for that seed to emerge out of the soil and create a beautiful plant or tree. Something similar to that, all of the causes of this universe were reduced to a, to a seed or to seeds. Each of us, we have a connection to a seed in the absolute. And from that seed, a divine or divinity emerges, and from that divinity, another type of enfoldment related to our soul emerges. There's absolute happiness within the abstract space. So the very beginning of this existence causes, as Samuel Unvior writes, the gods to weep because they have to go back into existence. The potentiality comes out during the Maha Manvantara, which means the Great Cosmic Day. And the Great Cosmic Day unfolds through an enormous process. And eventually that day ends in the same way that a physical day here rises and the sun eventually sets and then the, the light goes away. There's a Maha Pralaya, which is the great cosmic night. And that's when everything gets reabsorbed into the absolute. But that Maha Pralaya suspends the karma of the universe in order to bring everything back. But that, that, that Pralaya or Maha Pralaya only exists only occurs for a certain period or a certain space, and then all that karma has to come back into activity. And we see in nature, this uh, unfolds in all the different levels of our of self, in the day, and the fact that we go to sleep, we sleep, and then we arise in the next day with more or less the same mind and the same emotions that we had yesterday. But we know when we sleep, normally we're unconscious, and this state of the world, when we fall asleep, our mind is unconscious and we dream, and we may not even remember the dream. But that is our consciousness going through a little mini pralaya. If you awaken your consciousness, you can be awake while your physical body sleeps. And you could, you could see into that night. You would see the light of our own consciousness, which, is, which exists when we fall asleep. We don't experience it because we're unconscious. Something similar is occurring on the cosmic scale of the gods. Much, much higher level, though. There is a certain type of god or deity we call Paramatha Satya that could choose not to go into this existence because they have perfect consciousness. But those gods are not what's being talked about here. They can remain in the abstract space. They're not forced, they're not ejected into this world, into this universe, into this creation. We often talk about the three aspects of the absolute. These are very abstract concepts. They seem a little bit removed from our daily life. But in order to really understand the, 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 the essential content, we, we need to be able to have some grasp of what the absolute is. 
So the absolute is beyond creation. The absolute has three aspects. The most incomprehensible aspect is called the Ayin. In the Pista Sophia, it's called the 13th Aeon. That is the most abstract, absolute space. Totally incomprehensible to our mind. But the next aspect is the Ain Sof. In that level, as it's written here, a certain type of manifestation exists. But even that's a poor way of writing, a poor way of understanding it. It's just for our intellect to understand it. The Ain Sof, the second aspect, is this atomic principle, almost like that seed I was talking about, where our entire existence could be reduced to just the Ain Sof, our own particular Ain Sof, because we come from the absolute and the final synthesis. The Ain Sof is the second aspect of the absolute. It is where a certain manifestation already exists. A divine ray exists within the human being. That ray wants to return back to its own star that has always smiled upon it. The star that guides our interior is a super divine atom from the abstract absolute space. The Kabbalistic name of that atom is the sacred Aim So. So we can think in the sense that we come from the Ain Sof and we will return to the Ain Sof. The third aspect is written, each universe in the infinite space possesses its own central sun, and, in, and the addition of all those spiritual suns constitutes the Ain Sof Aur, the protocosmos, the solar absolute. So the Ain Sof Aur is the Another way of understanding it is that it's the Ain Sof, the ray of light that projects out of the Ain Sof into creation. It's that activity. The Ain Sof Or is an activity that descends into different levels, different dimensions, until finally reaching the physical world. So let us now talk about Pistis Sophia. Normally the word pistis is associated with our mind, with a certain level of consciousness of our mind. But in this context, pistis is not really mind. It's better understood as power. And Sophia means wisdom. So as a compound word, it signifies power, wisdom. So, in the Pistis Sophia, she is the central character, the central person or symbol that's undergoing many different dramas. The Pistis Sophia emerges from the Absolute, from the 13th Aeon, which is the Ain. And she goes down into all the lower aeons. She can manifest herself in any of these spheres of the tree of life, which we will talk about. Fundamentally, this two-part word of pistis and, so, and sophia, we can relate to two columns of the tree of life. Pistis, meaning power, relates to the left side of the tree of life. And wisdom relates to the right side of the tree of life. Now in Kabbalah, the head of the two of the left column is Binah, which is related to the Holy Spirit. And usually Binah is uh, translated as understanding. And on the right side, the head of the right column is Chokmah, which is related to the sun in Christian terms. And Hokumah means wisdom. 
So to say that pistis sophia is related to wisdom is simple, right? Because sophia means wisdom. But the pistis aspect related to power, we have to understand that the power of God comes from the left side. The power of the Holy Spirit is the creative potential. The power of God is the power to create. And that's happening foremost on that left side. So this tree of life we could put as a map. And if you were to put the image on, on the back of someone, you would have the left side and the right side, the two shoulders. And Keter on, on top is the father, the crown. So this left side... As it descends, it reaches the asod, which is the sexual organs, as a symbol. Or as the sexual organs within ourself is yesod. And that's where the creative potential comes into us. That's where we have the power to create. Even us as intellectual animals who know nothing about God, we still have the power of creation in our sexual organs, in our sexual glands. So that's where the power of God comes into us. We have an aspect of that power within us, even though we really don't have an aspect of that wisdom within us. So we see that the power comes down first. This is going to relate to the fact that Pistis Sophia, even though she comes from the 13th aeon, from the Absolute, she descends all the way down, and then she reascends all the way back up. And this is a summary of the whole great work. The emergence from the absolute, the descension, but then also the ascension back up. So we're going to actually now read out of the Pista Sophia, and we'll find out why it's so difficult to read this text. It's very symbolic. And we have to learn to understand it in a certain way and have to learn how to meditate on it. And Jesus answered and said unto his disciples. So the reason why he's talking right now, because in the book he was asked to elaborate on why the Pistis Sophia, why Pistis Sophia was not in the 13th aeon anymore. Mary asks this and he responds. It came to pass when Pistis Sophia was in the 13th aeon, in the region of all her brethren, the invisibles, that is, the four and twenty emanations of the great invisible, it came to pass then by the command of the first mystery that Pistis Sophia gazed into the height. She saw the light of the veil of the treasury of the light, and she longed to reach that region, and she could not reach to that region. But she ceased to perform the mystery of the 13th aeon and sang praises to the light of the height, which she had seen in the light of the veil of the treasury of the light. So let us look at this one piece at a time. First, we can understand the 13 aeons related to the Kabbalistic tree of life, which I have here on this slide. There are ten sephiroth in the tree of life, and there are three aspects of the absolute. So very simply, the thirteen aeons in the Pisces Sophia are those ten sephiroth and the three aspects of the absolute. Now we talk at length about the tree of life in previous lectures. But we're going to just give a basic map here, a basic understanding of what the 13th aeons are. If we start from the bottom, from the first aeon, and go from without to within, as it said in the book, we start here in Malkut, which is the physical body, the kingdom of this physical body, it's the first aeon. Second aeon, going upwards, is what I mentioned before, yesod, which was a word that means foundation. That's where the sexual energy is deposited within ourselves. That's where our vitality, our creative energy is there. 
and is related to our energetic body called the vital body. When we're born into this world, having done no work on ourselves, just like any person being born, we're born with a physical and vital body. Those are given to us for free. The third aeon is hod, which is related to the astral body, the center of emotions. We have something related to an astral body, but unless you actually perform a work within yourselves, you don't have a legitimate astral body. That's something you have to create. You have to be born again into that body. And that is a creation that only occurs through the power, which is related to our sexual energy. So our sexual energy is not simply a, a matter or a material that creates physical bodies. It can, but it has a direct connection to our spirit. It has a direct connection to the creative potential of God. There's something spiritual about it. The fourth aeon is Netzah, which is related to the mental body, related to our mind, to reasoning. The fifth aeon is Tifereth, which is the center of the human soul. A lot of the drama of the work occurs here, because you can see Tifereth is in the middle column, and it's also in the middle of the tree of life. So all of the initiatic and uh, all of the drama of the soul occurs around Tifereth, ultimately. You think of Tifereth as the center of a clock, and all the hours, all the initiatic hours and days are going around Tifereth because Tifereth is in the center. As the fifth aeon. The sixth aeon is Geberah, which is related to what we call the Buddhic body or the spiritual soul. Tifereth is the human soul. Geberah is the spiritual soul. The human soul, we say, is masculine. The spiritual soul is feminine. And the seventh aeon is Hesed, which is related to our inner spirit. And as a trimurti, our monad expresses itself firstly in, these, in this way. The spirit, the spiritual soul, and the human soul. But once again, the human soul doesn't come completely developed. It comes as an essence. It comes as a seed. And that seed unfolds itself into more types of seeds related to Netzach, Hod. So when we, when we find ourselves here in a physical body, we are only partly created. Our soul isn't created. We only have a potential of the soul. We have an essence. We have a consciousness. We have an, what we could say an elemental level of a soul. But it's not a, it's not a real human soul. So we need to possess our souls. We need to incarnate that. We need to work with that. So Hesed is our inner spirit. But there's more ands above that. The eighth and is related to Binah, which is the Holy Spirit, which is the third aspect of the Trinity, or the third Logos. The ninth aeon is Hokmah, which is the second Logos, which is the sun, which is where all the beauty and wisdom of the Christ resides. And then the tenth aeon is the Father, also called the Ancient of Days. And these three in Buddhism are related to the Nirmanakaya, the Sambhogakaya, and the Dharmakaya. And of course, the three aspects of the Absolute. The Ein Sof Aur, the Ein Sof, and the Ein. So when we talk about the Ein Sof Aur coming, being that projection, that is this arrow descending down. So the Ein Sof Aur goes through transformation, transformation, and more transformations as it's going down. But that Ein Sof Aur is where that ray of light is coming out and unfolding into all of the cosmos outside of ourselves, but also the cosmos inside of ourselves. So, 
Unless we know this, there's no way we're going to understand what the 13th aeon is. When it came to pass when Pistis Sophia was in the 13th aeon, what does that mean? Well, we know that it means that the Pistis Sophia was in the absolute. And in the region of her brethren, the invisibles. That's one of the most important things we have to understand if we're reading this text is all of the characters, all the personages in this text relate to parts of our own self. There's nothing that's outside of ourselves in this text. So Pistis Sophia is a part of our own being. Pistis Sophia is a part of our own being. It's a part of our being that's related to the 13th aeon. She is one of the most elevated aspects of our own being. Our own spirit. But when it says that she's in the region with her brethren, the invisibles, what this is talking about is other parts of our own being. Amazing as it may sound, our inner being has an essential quality of emptiness. This sounds very strange to us, but that absolute that we just spoke about is an abstract space. And that is where our being comes from. Our being manifests into forms into any form. Our being has that power, right? If the being has the capacity to manifest into any form, it must be beyond form. It is empty of form. No form contains it. And within that understanding, the being is not one thing. It is a it is an activity that we need to understand as being a multitude of many things relating to itself. When the, when the great work is completed, our being knows itself completely. Being, the being contains 100% self-cognizance, self-knowledge of its own self. Not just me as an ego knowing myself, or as a soul, but the whole being. There's parts of the being related to Christ. There's parts of the being related to the spiritual world. There's parts of the being related to the soul. There's parts of the being related here physically. And they all have to know each other and perfectly unite and form into a diamond soul. This is similar to the story of Moses pulling and getting all of the Israelites out of the rule of the Pharaoh. All of the, all of the Israelites represent, in summation, our being. It's a very profound thing to reflect on. It's very difficult. But that's, that's the reality. Our being is not a simple old man or woman in the sky, they can represent themselves as that. That can represent wisdom. That can represent love. But the being is beyond that. And that's partly why this text is so obscure to our understanding is because we don't understand our own being. But she was in the region of the, of the, great, of the invisibles and it mentions the four and twenty emanations of the great invisible. Four and twenty, or we can say twenty-four, is mentioned earlier in this text. The Arcanum 24 is called the Weaver. The Arcanum 24 is related to the loom of God. How God creates or fabricates the universe in relationship to the Arcanum 24. So this text is talking about the 4 and 20. It's relating itself to the Arcanum 24, which if we understand that, we know it's relating to creation. The creative power. 
That 24 gets reduced if you add 4 plus 2 into 6. It gets reduced to another number, which is related to uh, indecision. It's the name of this card, the sixth card. Sixth arcanum is the discernment and the knowledge to wisely use the power of God. How do we use, how do we, how do we, what decisions do we make to use the power of God? And there are basically two senses. One is to use the power of God to manifest our own desires. And another one is in order to manifest God and destroy our, and to destroy our desires. A lot of uh, wisdom in this card. On the top of the card, we see a man with uh, a bow and arrow. There's two women there. One woman represents the Divine Mother, representing chastity, sexual purity. And the other side is related to the harlot, using sexual uh, power or our sexual creativity to manifest our own desires, to indulge in our own desires. And this man is sitting lower in the waters of life, making a decision between one or the other. But ultimately, in order to progress in the path, we need to direct this arrow towards our own desires. And that arrow creates a triangle of three forces, which if we know how to point the three forces that we have within ourselves towards our ego, towards our desire, we can kill it in the same way that Cupid shoots an arrow. Cupid is related to the Holy Spirit. Another name for Cupid is Eros, and that's where we get the word erotic from. But we use our eroticism in a way that indulges into our ego. We can use our sexual creative power to destroy our ego. But all of this related to this text is in play right now. A very abstract level. The other number mentioned here is the number 13, which we said is the 13th aeon. And the number 13 is the number of death. Right? The number 13 is a very unlucky number. People don't like the number 13. Because it is. It's related to death. It's the number of death. But it is only through supreme death that something new is born. And in order to enter into the 13th aeon, there's a complete and radical death which is required. Pisces Sophia is in the 13th aeon, and she is in the region of the 4 and 20. That 4 and 20 is related to the 12 zodiacal houses. We know that there are a duality within every zodiacal house. 24 elders, two for each zodiacal house, right? So those 24 elders or those 24 brethren are 24 aspects of our own being related to the cosmos, related to different aspects of ourselves, related to those 12 tribes of Israel that Moses must work with or those 12 disciples of Jesus. Jesus being the 13, number 13. So what it is all saying is there's, a, there's something here related to creation. And by command of the first mystery, Pistis Sophia gazes into the light, and she sees the treasury of the light, and she, want, she yearns after the treasury of the light. Treasury of the light is the culmination of our spiritual work. Treasury of the light, in alchemical terms, is the philosophical stone. So Sophia is that aspect of our being that is looking to do the work. It wants to complete the work. And it gazes into the light at the command of the first mystery, meaning she's, she's implored to gaze into the light. 
And she wants to gain complete wisdom. She wants to complete the whole work. But something happens. It's not so simple. <clears throat> it came to pass then when she sang praises to the region of the height that all the rulers in the twelve aeons who are below hated her because she had ceased from their mysteries and because she had desired to go into the height and be above them all. For this cause then they were enraged against her and hated her as did the great triple-powered self-willed, that is, the third triple-power, who is in the thirteenth aeon, he who had become disobedient, inasmuch as he had not emanated the whole purification of his power in him, and he had not given the purification of his light at the time when the rulers gave their purification, and that he desired to rule over the whole thirteenth aeon and those who are below it. Pista Sophia talks about three triple light powers. And again, if you are not familiar with Kabbalah, then it seems very confusing. But if you know the Kabbalistic tree of life, it becomes, that aspect becomes much simpler. The first triple light power is related to the first triangle of the tree of life, which is the, the three logos, which is the Christic principle the aspect that the first division of God from one into three. And in each of these three aspects, the other two exist. The second triple light power is related to Hesed, Gebra, and Tifereth. Related to the world of the spirit. And then the third triple light power is the one that's disobedient. The third triple light power is called the self-willed. It's also later on called the lion-faced light power. So the third triangle here, Netzah is related to the mind, Hod is related to emotions, and Yesod is related to sex. That is the one that is disobedient. So we can see in ourselves we are really living in the third triple light power. Physically, we have an intellect, emotions, and our instincts and sexuality. So moment by moment, we are living the self-willed. We are the self-willed. That's exactly what the ego is, living in this region. Because in the second triple light power, the will of God is always done. That's, this is really what we consider heaven or nirvana. And there are superior aspects up there as well, of course. Of course, the will of God is done in the first triple light power as well. But when you get to that third triple light power, the will of God is not being done. The will of the ego is being done. But the way this is written, if we're talking about the manifestation of our own being into creation... The third triple light power exists in a potential form already. That third triple light power is already karmically becoming active, even if, it, even, if, even, if the, even if Sophia and the being haven't manifested here physically. They're coming out of the absolute. There's still a karmic residue or karmic legacy related to the, triple, the third triple light power, which is why it's talking that it's coming from the 13th aeon. And then, in other parts of the Pisces Sophia, I'll just mention that this last Sephiroth Malkuth, which is our physical body, is called the mixture in the Pisces Sophia. Why is it called the mixture? Because here, this physical body is the final crucible of all of this energy, of all of these different manifestations come into the physical body. And it's inside the physical body, it's with the physical body that we need to do the work. All the elements come together for the crossing and for that, the necessary crossing of those elements inside the physical body. So 
So if we continue on, I cut some out, which is what those dots mean. The great triple-powered self-willed emanated out of himself a great lion-faced power, and out of his matter in him he emanated a host of other very violent material emanations and sent them into the regions below, to the parts of the chaos, in order that they may that they might lie that there that <clears throat> in order that they might there lie in wait for Pisces Sophia and take away her power out of her. So we have a very uh, beautiful illustration here from William Blake, where a uh, dragon is about to impose himself on a beautiful woman in gold, which we can say symbolically here, I'm using is Sophia. So Sophia begins this, Sophia is impelled to look into the light. And she wishes to do the work. So she goes into the light and believes she's going towards the treasury of the light, but instead she ends up going towards the triple power self-willed, the light of the triple power self-willed. It came to pass then thereafter by command of the first commandment that the tr great triple power self-willed, who was one of the three triple powers, pursued Sophia in the 13th aeon in order that she should look towards the parts below so that she might see in that region his lion faced light power and long after it and go to that region so that her light might be taken from her. It came to pass then thereafter that she looked below and saw his light power in the parts below. And she knew not that it was that of the triple power self-willed. But she thought that it came out of the light which she had seen from the beginning in the height which came out of the veil of the treasury of the light. And she thought to herself, I will go to that region without my pair and take the light there out and fashion for myself light aeons so that I may go to the light of lights which is in the height of heights. So we see, here we see this first commandment, which is a symbol of the great um, cosmic common father causing a series of events to occur. In the same way that in the first slide, when the dawning of the great cosmic day occurred, the gods began to, we to weep, and they had no choice. They had to go into creation. In the same way here, a certain Pista Sophia is impelled or commanded to look into the light. And, and that first commandment, that intelligence, knows that Sophia, being unself-realized, that, that Sophia, not knowing all the parts of herself, not, not knowing all the different various parts of the being, will confuse that triple light power of the third with the treasury of the light. So this great drama occurs by command of the first commandment. First commandment is, no, it knows that this drama is going to occur, but it does it anyway. Because the first commandment is very interested in Sophia acquiring the treasury of the light, which is the philosophical stone. So we can see here there's a, there's a great symbol, or a great parallel of Lucifer falling from grace, or the disobedient angels. It's the very same myth, but shown from a different perspective. If you read or listen to a, previ a previous lecture called The Secret of Satan, you may understand this a little bit more. Let's, con let's just, we'll complete the story and then we'll talk about it. This then thinking, she went forth from her own region. The 13th Aeon went down into the 12 Aeons. The rulers of the Aeons pursued her and were enraged against her because she had thought of grandeur. 
And she went forth also from the twelve aeons and came into the region of the chaos and drew nigh to that lion-faced light power to devour it. But all the material emanations of self-willed surrounded her. And the great lion-faced light power devoured all the light powers in Sophia and cleaned out her light and devoured it. And her matter was thrust into the chaos. It became a lion-faced ruler in the chaos of which one half is fire and the other is darkness. That is Yalda Bayalt, of whom I have spoken unto you many times. When then this befell, Sophia became very greatly exhausted, and that lion-faced light power set to work to take away from Sophia all her light powers, and all the material powers of self-willed surrounded Sophia at the same time and pressed her sore. So we can see that our own ego, our own selfish desires, causes great suffering for our our innermost, our own God. And all of the karma oppresses Sophia. But one thing is for the power of Sophia to descend, and another thing is for the wisdom of Sophia to descend. What this text here is saying is that Sophia, this, this aspect of ourself, is descending into the lower Sephiroth, but by doing so and being created, it gets, Sophia becomes entangled in the karma. Because in the 13th aeon, there's no karma. There's no, there's complete freedom. So as that energy is descending, it is as if that karma related to the to you, um, the third triple power, which is where all that karma is being generated, comes and swallows up Sophia. And this is related to other myths, such as uh, the myth of Persephone or Proserpine, in which the underworld comes and devours a, a beautiful maiden. A beautiful maiden is our own soul in this respect. Sophia has many different aspects and ways of looking at it, but when our divine essence and our divinity is coming down into us, it immediately gets devoured by our karma and by our ego. And what comes out of it is Yaldabaoth. One half which is fire and the other which is darkness. We can say that's our ego. There's some light within ourselves, and there's some power, which is that fire, but the other half is darkness. It's been placed into darkness. But to better understand how the Ein Sof Aor descends, which is that that ray of creation coming down, you have to understand what the Pista Sophia calls the the spaces, which in Kabbalah are called the four worlds. The four worlds are Atziluth, Bria, Yetzira, and Asya. Because the first space, Atziluth, is a very is related to the archetypes, the, the, the blueprints, so the primordial, primordial aspects or molds of what the being can express itself as. And that's Atziluth, the archetypes or potentials. So that's related to the absolute. And it's also related to the top triangle. Bria is the very activity of that creation. Yetzirah is the third space, 
We're going to talk more about Bria in a moment, but after Bria, that creates Yetzirah, the formation. But that formation, as I just said, comes in two parts. There's two halves to it. The first is related to the third Logos, which is Binah. It descends first, that power. It creates, but the second Logos also has to descend afterwards, after, after the creation. So first is the third Logos, then the second Logos descends. So when we look at this cosmically, this whole universe, first the third Logos creates, then the second Logos goes into that creation to continuously sacrifice itself to to have life, to continuously regenerate life. Because Christ is the great sacrifice. But the great sacrifice doesn't happen until there's some creation there in order to have that life in there. And then Asya is just the, is the final mixture or synthesis of all the elements in the physicality of the physical world. When Sophia... is in those higher aeons, in the region of the 24 brethren of the great invisible. And she looks down and sees the light of the third triple light power. And she mistakes that light for the treasury of the light. What is, being, what is happening here is happening in Bria which is the world of creation. In Bria, nothing is actually created yet. It's, it's happening. It's the activity of creation. How Bria works related to the Trinity we know that Keter, Hokman, Binah are the three logos. They are three in one, but they there are three sides to it, so we can look at it from the Keter, Hokumah, or Binah. Binah is that aspect of the Trinity which has the creation. It does so by splitting itself into a duality, where each half of that duality has the Trinity. So this Binah splits itself into a masculine Trinity and into a feminine Trinity. And it's through that masculine and feminine trinity that then comes back together that the mystery of da'at, which means knowledge or gnosis, occurs. And it's in there that the actual product of creation are coming out of. So we can relate this to our own self. Because inside of ourselves, we have three centers, we have three brains, our intellect, our emotion, and our motor instinctive sexual brain. Intellect is in our head, our emotional brain is related to our heart, and the motor instinctive sexual brain is, of course, related to our sex and also to our spinal cord. So we are a trinity. And when one trinity crosses with another trinity, a feminine trinity trinity crosses with a masculine trinity, you can have a creation. So as below, so above. That God, or the Logos, or Christ, must divide itself in order to unite itself to create. That's the mystery of of Bria. The Holy Spirit, Binah, creates a masculine-feminine duality which provides the power of creation. And in this way, the ray of creation manifests through the seven mighty cosmo creators, which we, can, which we call Gabriel, Raphael, Uriel, Mikael, Samael, Zedekiel, and Orophiel. Okay, so what does that mean? Because in the beginning, we have Sophia, unself-realized Sophia. 
a type of monad or ein sof that does not know itself. A type of ein sof that will confuse the light of the treasury of the light with the light of the triple light power. Or an ein sof that still is karma and chaos. That type of ein sof or sophia can't place itself into creation because that type of monad doesn't have cognizance of the three primary forces. It doesn't have consciousness within the third triangle, within the Christic logoic triangle, because that's the triangle that can create something. That's the triangle that can create the universe. But those elements, those monads that are not self-realized, don't have realization of that, so they can't put themselves in creation. They need a helper. They need a cosmo creator. A cosmo creator is another monad, but this type of monad has self cognizance. This type of monad has incarnated Christ. They have perfected the power and wisdom. They have achieved the golden fleece of Hercules or the treasury of the light or the philosophical stone. They have achieved it. Therefore, they can work to place other monads into creation. So those seven mighty cosmic creators are what we call the seven rays. And all of, us, all of us, as a monad, belong to one of those rays. Because our individual monad, unless it's self-realized, can't put itself in, into creation. And, but the cosmic creators do it. So those cosmic creators are conscious within the upper cosmos. They're conscious within the world of Bria and Atziluth. So they can work with that energy to place the monads into creation. So all of us belong to one of those seven rays. And we can see that that, that is how the ray of Christ goes from a trinity to a sevenfold in Atziluth, because the creation happens according to the law of three, which we can see. But that creation then gets organized according to the law of seven, which are the seven mighty cosmic creators. Now the outcome, here we say da'at or gnosis. When Binah creates through the division, Descend, that outcome descends into the second triangle. Now, when that creation is complete, that is uh, Horus or Horus, the human soul, but the, the spiritual soul. But in the beginning, what it creates is our our soul, which then unfolds. First, as the spirit, then the spiritual soul, then the human soul, then the mind, emotions, sex, and the physical body. And the great work, the first thing we have to do after we, we receive a physical body, and we have a vital body, we have to create the astral body, the mental body, and the causal body. We think we're already completed. We think we're already a complete soul, but we're not. We're Yaldabaoth. We're at one half fire and the other half darkness. We haven't even completed that work yet. We're here as ego, some mixture in the physical body. We have some percentage of free consciousness, but mostly we're ego. And beyond, beyond the ego is just chaos. Because our inner matter is undifferentiated. Our inner matter is not developed. We are like an egg that has not been boiled yet. We have a thin layer called our personality and our physical body. But if that layer cracks open, what's in, what's in there, in that egg? Chaotic material that could become something. But if you crack that egg open, it's, it's a mess. That's why when we go out of our physical body, we can't have consciousness. We can't seem to have those experiences, or we have to work very hard to have them. 
That is why we don't remember when we're outside of our physical body, because that hard shell is gone, and all that is in our being at that level is chaos and darkness and fire, which is sexual potency, but most particularly um, desires and lust. That's what's inside of our psyche. That's Yaldabaoth which is causing Sophia, our divine essence, our divine principle, to suffer. She is in bondage. She is enslaved. When we said in the beginning that Pista Sophia is a compound word, first the power descends, then the wisdom descends. Right now the power has descended. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the power of the Holy Spirit. That's how we get into lots of trouble, though, is through that power how we use our creative potential. We use it correctly, then we finish our creation. We actually complete the soul. And then, if we complete the soul, then wisdom can descend into it. We think that Christ could descend into any ordinary person. But really, Christ can only descend into the, the fully developed man or woman. That is the second Logos. <clears throat> Samuel Unvior writes, That which is above is like that which is below. At the beginning of the aurora of creation, the sexual fire of the third Logos fecundates the womb of the Great Mother, the fundamental substance. The second part is performed by the second Logos, the cosmic Christ, by incarnating himself within those worlds that are arising so that all beings can have life and have it in abundance. This event is repeated within the microcosmos human. The first one who intervenes is the third Logos when fertilizing the chaotic matter contained within the semen and in the dorsal spine fertilizing the Divine Mother, the Akashic Principle, so that the inner universe, the solar bodies, are born. Thereafter, the second Logos is born within those superior existential bodies of the being in order to work in the great work of the Father. The reason why this is important to understand is that the book of the Pistis Sophia is really a book for people who have already completed becoming a man, or a human being, we should say. They've already created those bodies, and they're ready for the second Logos to come and descend. So we can read that work, and we can understand it, especially with the commentary that Samuel Anveor writes in order for us to understand various aspects of the work. It has a level for us to understand. But the real work is related to the resurrection, related to the incarnation of Christ in the human being. So... In the dawn of each Mahamanvantara, the Great Mother, the universal feminine principle, steals the fire from the gods in order to fertilize herself and to shine with pleasure. This is the universal protogonos. This is the tragedy of the gods. This is what the logoic downfall is. The gods can be liberated only when their virginal sparks are liberated. So our essence is that virginal spark. And although we often think that God is omnipotent and omniscient and free, there are different levels of that. Because ultimately, we are connected with God. And if we are in karma and if we are suffering, then a part of God is suffering. So when we liberate ourselves, then we can incarnate Christ as well. In the Pista Sophia unveiled, it's written, the divine ray and the chaos, Pista Sophia and the great abyss, shine with pleasure when united. 
Thus the chaos delectably sparkles when obtaining its meaning from this union with the Spirit. When Sophia, as divine spirit, is associated with the chaos, then the protogonos, the primogenial, the primogenial light, emerges. The logoic ray impregnated by Sophia fecundates the waters of life in order for the universe to emerge. So when Samael Unvio writes his commentary, he writes it in a way that's very beautiful. Within the text of the Pista Sophia itself, it appears very violent. We have to understand that both of those ways of presenting it are the same. It's just a matter of how we want to look at it, from what perspective. Because from the higher parts of the being, the ejection from the absolute abstract space into creation is a very uh, very difficult thing. And all the parts of the being start antagonizing each other. Different parts of the being don't understand each other. And through that antagonism, the drama occurs. And Sophia needs to work with all those different parts. And all those different parts don't want to give up their own material. In other words, they don't want to give up their own chaos. They don't want to give up their own sense of identity. But as they do, as Sophia works in all those different aspects, the being is being united. So let us look a little bit on this word yalda bayot. In Hebrew, you can dissect it as yalda and the word bohu and also the word abit. Yalda means child. Bohu means void. Uh, such as the phrase toho ve bohu which means formless and void. And abut meaning father. So this is how we get the, the phrase children of the void. But there are two types of children in this sense. Because there's another word here, sabayot, which means army or host, lord of hosts. The being in itself cannot be outlined and diagrammed. We cannot make an exact diagram since the being is like an army of innocent children. That is the being, and one must learn how to know this in order to understand it. So the being is related to this word sabayoth, which is an army. Usually, think of an army of God as all these millions of angels. But those millions of angels exist within us as angelic intelligence different aspects of our own being. But the other type of children of the void is that chaotic material that is our ego. Yalda Bayoth is a mixture of that power of Sophia mixing with our ego and producing all these offspring, which is one half fire and one half darkness. That's animating our chaotic material. So Yalda Bayat is both the good and the evil. Yalda Bayat is related to the architect demiurge of the universe. Because this universe is ruled by karma, and karma lands on either the side of good or evil. So Yalda Bayat is all of the good and is all of the evil as well. But there's something beyond Yalda Bayat, which is that 13th aeon, which is beyond good and evil. This is why in many Gnostic texts they talk about Yalda Bayoth as being a god, but a god that one must go beyond. There's different ways to look at this, because Yalda Bayoth is the elements of our own ego, but even outside of ourselves, there are elements, we have to go beyond creation itself, right? even those cosmo creators, those cosmo creators are working in the work of the Father to go beyond creation. They're at that level where they can work with creation, but they're looking to go even beyond it. So those gods can be tempted by all the beautiful manifestations and forms of this world. And if they fall into that temptation, they stay in creation. Only the one or the, the being who renounces everything 
and accomplishes the 13th arcanum completely, achieves absolute death, can, it, can go beyond creation. We may think that we can become, we, we may have troubles uh, becoming detached or becoming less attached with like our technology or our phone or some television or movie or something like that. But imagine being the intelligence of an entire constellation and the beauty and magnificence of that, being at that level of being, because those are the, those are the levels of the cosmo creators. Being an intelligence which manages this entire earth or this entire solar system, because there are intelligences, there are beings or monads that are doing that, they have to give that up. They have to learn how to, at a very, very subtle level. So when the Gnostics are talking about not falling under sway or fighting against Yaldabaoth, it has a dualistic meaning, fighting against her own ego, but also fighting against all of the pleasures and divine powers that we may possess. In the Pisces Sophia, Yaldabaoth is often spoken of in uh, relationship to 49 demons, the 49 demons of Yaldabaoth. And those are the 49 subconscious levels of our own mind. Now, the lion-faced power, or the lion-faced light power, is how Yaldabaoth is often described in the Pisces Sophia. That lion is related to two, two principal symbols. One, the lion of the law, the power of karma. And the other is that uh, sexual energy again, solar energy related to the sun. The lion is related to the sun, the solar Christic energy. So again, that lion-faced light power is that light, light power related to our karma, but related also to Christ at the same time. In the 11th Arcanum, the 11th uh, card features the lion. And a woman, a divine woman, opening the, the jaw of that lion with tremendous sincerity and tranquility, meaning that that person has achieved um, dominion over that, that lion power. And due to that, we see the philosophical stone at the bottom of the card with the sparrow and serpent, which is related to our, is related to Horus and to our, our divine mother and to our sexual power. So Yaldabaoth is working within us right now, and we, we feel that power anytime we become identified with something, anytime we have a passionate type of energy, an egotistical type of urge, that is the very lion-faced light power working within us. And we have to fight against it. We have to go within those 49 levels, within those 49 demons of Yaldabaoth, and understand them and comprehend them and eliminate them with that same power with that, that card of indecision, instead of choosing wrongly, we choose correctly to use that power to eliminate our ego. And by doing that, we accomplish the 11th Arcanum, which has a phrase related to it, coagula et salve. By using our sexual energy cor uh, correctly, by using the power of the lion correctly, we coagulate or create the soul. We manifest our truths, we manifest our self in completion. We're no longer formless and void. And then we, uh, the second half occurs with the dissension of Christ and the complete dissolution of the ego. We see those two halves there. Do you have any questions? So there is karma in the 13th eon, or so there is, as the first you said, the whole reason why everything is created is because of karma permanent. And then you said there's no karma because it's absolutely. 
Right. Right. So is there more than one question? Yeah, like why is it sadness and not joy? I guess I'm assuming the answer is because it's a multiple aspect of being. And the other one is, is there a comma? I mean, yeah, is there a comma in the judgment of the young or not? Okay, so there is there is no karma inactivity in the 13th aeon, but there is the seeds or, or the legacy of karma that's not being played out, which is the exact reason why the 13th aeon spits spits out all of those elements which still have those karmic residue. Or, or, and that, then those seeds of karma then begin to unfold. So the seeds of karma exist before um, the triple light big power act. Well, in our case, when Sophia is looking into what she thinks is the hype, but is, she's looking into the Akashic waters of Bria, Seeing what she is seeing the potential of the completion of the work, the treasury of the light, but it's actually the triple light power, right? But where is the treasury of the light to be found inside the work? Right, so she sees the height of heights because she's on, this is unself realized Sophia. She sees the height of heights inside the potentiality in that moment. That's the way it's, it's, it's uh, symbolized. The other way to look at it is that Sophia is unself-realized, so she doesn't have that completion of wisdom to know the difference. But, the, but another way of looking at it is you're looking into the Akashic waters, the potential of creation. Inside that creation, I can get the treasury of the light. Right. See, even though like, I, I'm going to get that, but once I, once I go into that, well, the ego, all the, all the karma and chaos occurs. But that what, that's what needs to happen in order, in order to complete the work. You can't complete the work without the dissension. So it's, things are symbolized in a certain way in the Pista Sophia that are hard for our intellect to understand. But it's written in a dramatic form. And the triple light vision power is another aspect of our being, right? Right. In, I mean, there's a triple light power in Bria. It's, well, that's, well, the one that's originally in the 13th field. Right. That's part of the superior part of being, beyond what's in the sadness. Beyond right. I mean, ultimately, all parts of ourselves have a relationship to the 13th aeon, even the third triple light power, even our karma. So in that, in that aspect, it's not, it's, it, 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 it confuses our intellect. But we have to look at that before the creation occurs, before Yaldabaoth actually emerges, that third triple light power is just abstract potentiality of, the, of, of Yaldabaoth that hasn't actually occurred yet. We have to understand it in, in its own level. The freedom of nirvana or the freedom of the seventh dimension or any of these dimensions is always greater than the freedom below it. 
ultimate freedom, final liberation is related to the absolute. So, in a relative sense, coming even out of the absolute into the seventh and sixth dimension feels like a great sadness. A sadness in the same way like if you have a, a nice visit with somebody and then you have to leave. You might cry. Or you might be sad. But you still might have that in freedom or, or enjoyment afterwards. But there's a separating there that's very painful in that aspect. We relate it to our human emotions. And, of course, Samael is writing it in a way that we can understand it better. But those are something beyond emotions. They're always symbolized. We shouldn't see it just from our ego, like the way we suffer with our ego at the same time. There is suffering related to our ego, and there's, there is types of, of pain and suffering related beyond the ego, without an ego as well. That's something we have to contemplate, how the different parts of the being are suffering. Until every part of the being has zero karma, there's going to be suffering. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Thank you.